Hi there, uh, welcome to this vodcast. It's going to look at one of the end topics with regards to the medicine through time section of paper one. And as you can see, we're going to have a look at the National Health Service and the development of the welfare state. So our presentation objective is really to understand why the welfare state was created, what motivated the decision making on that. It's going to have a look at the National Health Service in a bit more depth and it's having a look at how people reacted to the NHS. And finally, how the NHS and the welfare state have changed over time. So first off, motivations. World War II was a big motivating factor. In the early months of the war, uh, children from the inner cities were moved into the countryside. And this really gave middle class people a degree of shock as to how these children were deprived in terms of their diet, exercise, and just their general state of health. Now, that opened up a lot of kind of soul searching in the nation about what they wanted the country to be like after the war. Linked to that was just the way in which the government had taken on a more significant role during the wartime. To cope with casualties, the government set up an emergency medical fund and provided free medical treatment. You also saw rationing and basically a heavier degree of government intervention in people's lives. So it really kind of altered people's mindsets with regards to government intervening in ordinary people's lives and with regards to healthcare and various other aspects of their lives. So we come to this man, Sir William Beveridge. Now he published a report in 1942 and he was really given the task of creating a kind of sense of what the country should be like once the war was won. So he talked about the role of the government being being markedly different from changing it from a kind of not so much laissez-faire, it changed from that, but from the kind of liberal reform era to really providing a cradle to grave public health system, a social welfare. So his report became a bestseller and it was a far cry. If you think about it, we're talking 1940s, 1840s, you were seeing the you know, the, the rise of the dirty party, it was laissez-faire, it was leave alone. But a hundred years later, you've got a man actively promoting the idea of cradle to grave healthcare and social, uh, social welfare provision. And it pointed the way to a better society. So the creation of the NHS was really down to this man here, a guy called Bevin. In 1945, the Labour Party were elected. Churchill was, was kicked out of office. Clement Attlee was brought in and he told Bevan that he was going to be given the task of masterminding the National Health Service, getting it passed. And so in 1948, it came into operation as part of a wider welfare state. And the NHS gave, it's supposed to, it did, it gave free medical treatment for all, regardless of income, paid for through taxation. You also saw other developments, family allowance and national insurance for everyone was also established. And one issue was, and it's really critical with the NHS as well, was that things like family allowance were paid to the women rather than the main wage earner, which at that point was typically men. And that was because what they realized was that women were putting themselves kind of bottom of the heap in terms of healthcare. And this was a kind of big focus on that. So now we're gonna have a look at the opposition to the NHS. And opposition was quite high uh, when it was initially developed. And three groups in particular opposed it. The, the British Medical Association, the local authorities, and those who saw it as simply going to be costing too much. And in the background here, you can see Harley Street, the, car, the area where lots of private doctors would practice. And they're aiming to trip up Bevin as he's, as he's kind of marching towards developing the NHS. So why did the BMA oppose it? Well, doctors within the British Medical Association opposed it because they believed the NHS would stifle their ability to earn money, their ability to work with private patients. They thought they'd be told where to go and how much they could be paid and how much they could earn. Local authorities also opposed the NHS because what they saw was this idea of nationalisation, especially of resources, resources that they'd invested in. So you can imagine hospitals that have been built are now being taken on by the NHS. Uh, nurses and midwives that have been trained at cost um, 
by the local authorities are going to the NHS and you know the, the local authorities aren't getting any of any of that money back from all that cost the NHS are just taking it and as you can see here there's a little kind of leaflet here and it's going to talk about what the NHS was was designed for and if you pause it you can have a read through it. it's a lovely little article there uh, a leaflet that was given to all these people and it does say it's you know there's no fair one with this it doesn't create new hospitals because they are in fact taking local authority hospitals uh, and other hospitals that are available the last group that of people that opposed it were those who saw it, simply opposed it on the basis of cost um, this was the greatest social welfare experiment or development ever and you know the NHS is still seen as some kind of big experiment uh, throughout the world especially if you go to the United States they view it differently uh, and they you know the cost would be enormous and they simply saw it as too expensive now the architects of the NHS like people like Bevan said the cost was necessary to make it work and that it would reduce over time as people get healthier now unfortunately that's not been the case and it's simply by the fact that as people live longer uh, we get other situations other health care issues that have come along so we'll have a look at the NHS itself now. At first, doctors, other health professionals didn't like it. They feared they would lose their freedom, their flexibility, and their ability to actually work on private patients. But Bevan agreed they could still see private patients whilst being in the NHS. And when they were in the NHS, they'd be paid a fee for every patient registered. So they had a degree of autonomy as to how much they were earning. So, was it effective? Well, by 1948, when the NHS kicked into gear, 92% of doctors were in the NHS, as were the vast majority of hospitals. But the costs were enormous. In 1950, it was costing £350 million a year to run, and it was way over budget. In fact, they didn't really get the budget accurate I think for a further one to two years after that. Added to this was simply the cost of fighting a war in Korea. Um, Britain was involved in, in a conflict in Korea along with the Americans and this coupled with the rising cost of the NHS meant that three years after the NHS, two to three years after the NHS was created, um, prescription charges came into effect and in fact Bevin resigned over the issue. So what else did the NHS do? Well it had a big focus on vaccination. And this was because there hadn't really been a vaccination program since the smallpox vaccine in 18 in the 1850s and in 1948 the nhs believed a healthier nation was one in which it would actually reduce cost so there was a focus on tuberculosis to begin with and then in 1954 in uh, you, you kind of saw infant uh triple vaccines for diphtheria whooping cough and tetanus and then a year later you saw polio um, and then other vaccines such as measles and rubella. So what changes have occurred in the NHS? Well, it's still undergoing changes and developments, but the modern NHS is a far different one than the original one of 1948. Uh, hospitals have reverted back to a degree of self-control. We talk about hospital trusts who uh, can, work, can work in a market forces kind of way where they can buy in services. Um, and our changes in, in the views on private medicine have also created what can be seen as a two-tier system. Private healthcare still existed in 1948. There were still patients who go private, but there's a lot more kind of different uh, providers of private healthcare now. And there's been more focus on preventative medicine to avoid the cost of a patient becoming ill. And this can be seen with issues like obesity or smoking and thing, and even things such as, you know, for, for women's smear tests and also for the vaccinations like HPV, uh, meningitis vaccines, etc. So there is a, a continuing focus on this idea of preventative medicine and preventive programs to reduce illness. OK, well, I hope that's been useful. If you have any queries or questions, please feel free to comment. Thank you for listening and good luck.